Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, <clears throat> episode 131, Train Spotting. What exactly is a train game? I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record here live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Tonight, we actually have part one of a two-part podcast series. We, we like, plan two, three weeks ahead here, which is not something we normally do. I'll admit it, sausage making. I usually pick the topic, like, Tuesday sometimes. It's happened on Wednesday. Sometimes we're planned a little bit further ahead. The reviews are usually scheduled. But, no, we actually uh, were going to talk about this a couple weeks ago and decided to push it out because we wanted to do a bit more research. So tonight, what we're going to be talking about is train games and the same thing next week. So in this first episode, what I figured made the most sense to start with is figuring out what the heck people mean when they say a train game and talk about why this definition seems to be so hotly debated. That some people think something is a train game and other people think it's not and so on. Now, our first review sticks to this theme as I've got some prototypes of some 18 share and 18 coins. These are upgrades from Mercury Games for 18XX style train games. Now off that, I do go off the rails for a bit with a review of a little wordy, which is the latest game from Exploding Kittens. And then we've got a surprisingly long, I assume, uh, Bellhop's Table Talk segment, because not only did I get it like a handful of games to the table, Sean's got some games to talk about as well. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Our first comment goes back on our topic of surprisingly easy games. Games okay. that were easier to learn and play than we expected. Don writes, what about chess? It's not only a complicated game adults enjoy, but also fun for young children. Mm. Just check, check Storytime Chess, Chess Solitaire, No Stress Chess, and Maxim Axanov chess puzzles book. Okay. Well, thanks for the comment, Don. Uh, of those, I've actually heard of all of those except for that puzzle book. That sounds interesting. I'll admit, I love chess puzzles in video games, like St Seventh Guest or uh, th those style of games. Often have um, chess style puzzles, and I gotta admit, some people may be a bit intimidated by chess. I don't think that's as common as it used to be, uh, and the basic moves are definitely easy to learn. But I think, in general, chess is about as easy as most people expect it to be. I think everyone knows that chess is a simple enough game to learn, learning the moves, but extremely difficult to become a master. And that's why I didn't even think to put it on the list, because to me, it's not a surprisingly easy game. It's just an easy-to-learn game with surprising depth. What about you? Do you think chess belongs on our list of surprisingly easy games? Yeah, I mean, there's no denying the power and value of chess, but the hardest thing to learn about chess is how the knight moves and castling. Once yeah. you've got those, the rest is all what to do with it when, just as expected by most, I think. I will mention one thing that it's difficult to learn is en passant. It took me forever to learn that, and I'll admit it's been so long since I played, I don't remember it now either. <laughs> that was that was worse than trying to figure out the knights are castling. Okay. Well, next up, a few short comments to stoke our egos. Michael Simonek wrote to say, nice deep review in regards to your look at Legendary Metal Coins Season 6. Yeah. Eric Placenica wrote, thanks for this. It seems like it is absolutely worth it in regards to our Shadowrun 6th World Beginner Box review. And finally, Jenkogo left this on our Shogun actual play video on YouTube. I want to play this bad. I'm waiting <laughs> for the upgrades I bought on Kickstarter. Thanks, Michael, Eric, and Jacogo. Jankogo, sorry about that. Uh, Shogun, I totally forgot about the Shogun upgrades, where it actually changed the cubes to meeples. Right. Like, even when I put this in the show notes, I was thinking, well, I wonder what Shogun updates are talking about. I also completely forgot we recorded a Shogun actual play video <laughs> until I got this comment. And I'm like, oh, that's right, Sean was down, and we played, like, a six-player game with Kat and Tori. Yep. All right, well, next up, a longer comment on our horrified review from Claire Ford. I understand that two players is too easy and four is too difficult. I'm guessing this is because each play round consists of one player, one monster, and four monsters are a lot to deal with. Two monsters are too easy. Our play group is a consistently six to eight. 
Do you mm. think altering the game to one monster per round, per two player rounds, would allow for more players without resulting in a total party kill every session? Well, thanks for this comment, Claire. So first up, I need to clarify something. And unfortunately, I, I asked Claire this. And I didn't actually get an answer. But based on this comment, now let me know if you're reading it the same way. It almost sounds like Claire is basing the number of monsters being used during a game of Horrify to the number of players. And that's not right. That's not what the game is about. It's actually the number of players don't matter at all. The monster choice, how many monsters you face, is based on how difficult you want the game to be, with two being the easiest, going potentially all the way up to six. It's the number of monsters that sets difficulty level that has nothing to do with the number of players. Now, I will say that two monsters is definitely easier than four, but I don't actually find the game easier with two players. Actually, I found it quite the opposite. I found it more difficult with less players. Now, in general, with games like this, player count doesn't really have a huge impact due to the mechanic of a player goes and the monsters go. So the less players, the less monster turns, the more players, the more monster turns. Now, where the advantage comes in in Horrified is with the cards you're dealt at the beginning of the game. Additional heroes mean starting with more cards, and those cards can be huge, and the difference between winning and losing the game. Now, there's also the small advantage of being able to spread out better on the board in order to collect items, depending on where they randomly show up. But that doesn't seem to have as much impact as having more cards. Now, as for playing the game with more players, I personally re wouldn't recommend it uh, for a few reasons. The main one being the whole player goes, monster goes thing involves drawing a pile from the monster deck. And with six to eight players, you are going to burn through that deck very quickly. And what that's going to mean is that Every player is going to have less turns. They're going to have less actions before the game ends and have less individual impact on the game. Like, I, I don't know the actual numbers, but I'm thinking you're only going to get like three to four turns per player. And that's not a lot of actual engagement during the game. And then there's the issue of downtime, waiting for seven other people to take their turn before it gets to you. And then one of the biggest issues with all uh, cooperative games is quarterbacking. And I'm sorry, but I don't want to be at a table where eight people are trying to same the same, solve the same puzzle at once. That just sounds like a mess. Now, what I actually recommend you do, Claire, and anyone else who's considering this, is I would pick up a second copy of Horrified and then run it like as a joint game so that they're both happening at once. I would run two games, and one table would face off against three monsters, and the other table would face off against the other three monsters. So all six monsters are in play. And I'd probably just leave it at that at first, but I would and make it so that like both teams have to win for the whole group to win. But then to make it more interesting, assuming that works, I'd probably toss in some house rules where you could swap characters between boards and any two players can swap spots if you need different abilities. Or maybe using the taxi cards lets you swap which board you're on. Or maybe even having an ability that you can share the, the power cards with each other. I think that sounds great. Like I'm totally up for playing eight player horrified with two boards fighting all the monsters at once. You hear that, publishers? How many people suggest buying more than one copy of your <laughs> games? <clears throat> now, finally, let's leave off with a couple of comments on our Dungeons & Dragons Adventure Begins review. Ren, uh, Ren W-R-E-N, Agade Studios, comments, Almost bought this yesterday as a gateway for my eldest son, 8, who is interested in playing D&D, but maybe a bit young for starting 5e. I started at 7, but that was first edition. After reading your review, I think I might give this a miss and set him up with a simplified campaign. Great review, by the way. And X Radman Tom X wrote, Just played this with my four and six year old. They used a blindfold on the beholder. Some new D D players were born. Oh, thanks both of you for your comments. Um, I love seeing these two comments together because first off, we've got Renegade Game Studios, which is not the publisher Renegade, spelled W-R-E-N. They may be a publisher, but they're not the same Renegade that publishes board games we've reviewed. Um, saying they read the review and went, ooh, this game's not right for me, and didn't buy it because of our review. And I think that's awesome. I, I, I encourage that to go against Sean, to counter me trying to tell everyone to buy two copies of Horrified, I guess, trying to balance things out. Um, no, I love seeing that. And then we have someone else that played it and had a great experience and totally agrees with how cool the game is. And I love the contrast of those two. And I got to say, Renegade, I think you're making the right decision here. Like I personally started with RPGs when I was only eight years old and I taught myself from old TSR rule books. So eight's probably a good age for a full role-playing game. 
Plus, um, like you're saying, you, you learned it back with first ed. I would say fifth edition D and D is probably easier to learn than first edition D and D. They've done a lot to really streamline things and make it more approachable. Now, while my kids are older, um, they've been loving Adventure Begins. So, I, I felt no real need to move. Excuse me. I felt no real need to move up to uh, fifth ed. Now they have played much more complicated RPGs and they've been trying to convince me to run fifth ed, but they still had a great time with Adventure Begins, but more as a storytelling experience and be able to tell silly D&D stories than as a game experience. Right. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Mm -hmm. Tonight, we've got a co topic that recently came up on our Tabletop Bellhop Patreon patron-only Discord server about train games. That is, the topic of defining what exactly a train game is. Now, while this only recently came up on Discord, this is a topic that has popped up a number of times since we started the show, uh, mainly when reviewing games, specific train games. Um, plus, many times before I was the tabletop bellhop, just in my gaming career and going to conventions and being a gamer involved in the community, for some reason, this is a popular recurring discussion or sometimes argument that the board game community seems to like to have over and over again. Like uh, role-playing game edition wars and talking about what's better, Star Wars or Star Trek, or who wins a race between Superman and The Flash. We should point out that it does seem to be a matter of human nature. People mm. feel more comfortable when they can speak in absolutes. Flash is the fastest person running on a solid surface. Star Trek is the far superior intellectual science fiction canon. Uh, no starting those arguments tonight on my part. We'll just let Sean have his own opinions. Now, before we get into our thoughts on the matter, what I did is I actually reached out as part of my research and asked people on social media, what do you think is a train game? What do you define as a train game? And I was actually surprised that, that most people were, uh, I don't want to give away which side we're on yet, but I was surprised by the, the comments. We'll, we'll say that. So what we're going to do is share some of those comments on what people think we mean when saying a train game. So, Ari Covert says, having played with expert train gamers, train game apparently means a combination of games with trains in them, pick up and deliver games, route building games, economic games where you can buy and sell stocks, and games where you move cubes on a map. Okay. Ticket to Ride, for example, is not a train game. Iron Dragon is. Next, I got a comment from Red Meeple Ryan, fan of the show, in our chat room tonight. Any game where the direct development of or delivery along trade routes is a prominent part of gameplay. Games where financial speculation on routes and cargo are prominent are stock games. Now, Mike Tamonin says, if someone tried to entice me by telling me it was a train game and there wasn't a train involved somewhere, <laughs> I'd be upset. Ticket to Ride, Last Spike, any of the 18xx games, any of the Mayfair Crayon games, but there's got to be a train in it. Mike Nathanachak notes, a train game is a game with trains, specifically locomotive ones. People are just lazy and want to use it as a shorthand for a particular type of game or combination of mechanisms. Now, I did ask for a definition of what combination of mechanisms, but I haven't heard back at least at this point. Uh, Ian Borchardt says, a game with train tracks at a minimum. I do consider Rail Baron to be a train game. Tommy Ray, a game where the primary component, mechanism, or gameplay involves train or engine that rides on rails. V. Lin says, a game with paths, tracks, that the players want to control for scoring. I like that one because that is completely different from yeah. everyone else's example. I, I actually like that someone, there's a specific game that comes to mind for that definition, which, which I think is really interesting. Now, Peter Schott said trains are involved. It's a pretty broad definition with so many games involving trains that appeal to different people. I'm not going to assume much more. Fair. Now, Tommy Ray says a game where the. Oh, I think I had that one already. Sorry. Oh, did we do? Oh, we did. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, my bad. <laughs> that's my bad i had so many of these and i was trying to organize yep. them so sean and i could go back and forth all right we'll skip that one jump to this so board game geek is of course where i went so i just googled train games board game geek 
And what I got was train games often involve gameplay and imagery related to railroads and rail vehicles. Many of the most popular train games are set in the late 19th and early 20th century, although some games like Lunar Rails are set in the future. Now, Board Game Geek also has a definition separate from that in uh, they actually have a glossary. There is a there is actually a Board Game Geek glossary that I happened across today <laughs> where they say train game noun. A game that features route building and or picking up and delivery of commodities along particular routes as the main mechanisms. The crayon rail games like Empire Builder and Euro Rails are good examples of train games. I like that one actually quite a bit. Now I'd like to add in the Wikipedia definition because there is one. A train game or railway game is a board game that represents the construction and operation of railways. Train games are often highly involved hobby games that take several hours to play. Like war games, train games represent a relatively small niche in the games market. For the record, don't look up the Urban Dictionary definition. But I digress. <laughs> yeah, well, we're not going to touch that one tonight. So I, I don't know, that just kind of felt like it was all going in circles and everyone's got a different opinion. So I don't think that was really getting us anywhere. So what I want to do for us now is take a different approach. Instead of trying to define it, let's break down what are the elements of a board game? What mechanics, what game types are most associated with train games? Like what are the things that make a train game a train game? Obviously, besides the fact it just has a train in it, because <laughs> That, that that's assumed i think at this point or maybe not actually because some people seem to think some games without trains are train games well i think one thing that comes up in the majority if not every single one is route building yeah that's the, really what uh, most people i think think of uh when they think of train games other than a few of the very niche definitions we've run into yes yeah you are putting something on a map connecting cities connecting delivery points connecting something and i've got to admit almost every train game i got a pile of them behind me has that aspect to it i i would almost go so far as to say if you if someone generically says it's a train game to me if i don't know their definition of train game i'm gonna assume they're talking about a road building game of some sort now, that would be my default now next up is one that is common but not necessarily universal and that's mm -hmm. pick up and deliver because there's a lot of games that aren't train games where there's also still pick up and deliver. Yeah, plus the opposite. There's a huge, very important section of train gaming that has no picking up and delivering, and that is 18xx games. 18xx, you're just connecting routes, and there's a huge stock market thing and a bunch of other stuff, but there's no picking up a red cube and delivering it to the red city. That is not an aspect of the 18xx games. Now, where that comes out is in the uh, what they, the Age of Steam, the Steam games and railways of the world and there, there's a whole batch of games in there that's their main part yes you're building routes but you're building routes to pick up and deliver something so pick up and deliver definitely not a requirement for a train game but often common in train games i think is where i would go with now one thing i think a lot of people have come to associate with train games and this is an interesting one for me is owning stocks in companies yes that is the part that is the major part of 18xx. So the, the, the concept that you are not running a train company, rather you are a rail baron investing in train companies, trying to end the game with the biggest portfolio. Now, that aspect is still in games like Steam, just the way the economy works and the loan system works and the auction for actions kind of simulates that. You're not actually taking stocks and holding stocks and there's no trying to figure out majority shares, but it is actually simulated. And I'll mention later exactly why, but I personally think there's an aspect of this even in games like Ticket to Ride that most people may not realize because it's so abstracted there. But yes, a big part of many train games is the, the economy, the stock market. Now, the next uh, mechanic is in some ways linked with pick up and deliver or often is. And that is completing contracts. Yes. But that is also linked to route building. So it's also the you get some bonus if you are able to connect this part of the board to this board. Now, that is the main goal of one of the lighter games we'll be mentioning tonight, but is also a big part of 18xx. And one of the things that changes when it separates one 18xx game from another is which routes exist and some bonuses for connecting set routes. And then there's games like German Railways or Last Train to Nuremberg, which I forgot to bring upstairs, where you get a huge bonus 
or sorry, first train to Nuremberg, not last, that wouldn't make sense. First train to Nuremberg is a, a route building game, really simple one, but you get a huge bonus if you are the first person to get your route to Nuremberg. But you don't necessarily win the game, it's just a bonus. So that to me counts as a contract. There is a goal to your, your route building that fits just as well as the, uh, the the tickets and Ticket to Ride, where you are trying to complete different contracts or you get bonuses for, for completing them and you get a penalty for failing. That also exists in other games that aren't train games, don't have trains in them, but people sometimes consider train games. An example of that would be Shipyard, where you're actually moving boats, but there are definitely contracts to complete, and it's government contracts or personal contracts, and the end game scoring is all based on if you made ships that fit that contract. So next up, if you've got engines and you've got rail lines, you might as well be able to upgrade them. Yeah, and then again, this this to me goes back to um, your 18xx games, and as far as I understand, even some of the earlier crayon rails, your routes can only go so far until you improve your engines. That's a big part of a lot of train games, but it also applies to train games that defy that entire route building. There is a very solid one of my favorite games that has no route building, no pickup and deliver, no owning stocks, no completing contracts, but it's all about upgrading your engines and railroads. And that is Russian railroads and the expansion German railroads. And I got to say, I challenge most people to try to tell me that's not a train game. Uh, so next up, we have set collection. So this I've seen in some train games, um, whether that's a reward for delivering different colors of cubes or sets of cubes, or you're trying to collect stocks of different companies. Even the, even the stock element is a bit of set collection. Do you decide to collect stocks from all the different companies in play, or do you go for a huge majority stock in a single company? That's one aspect of it. And then, of course, there's the do I take all the red cards so I can play a big red route later in the game? All right, well, let's move on, and we'll look at some of the main types of train games. All right, so most train gamers, uh, talking about those heavy train gamers, seem to consider certain two, two types of games worthy of the name train game, the, the, the real train game groignards. Um, and they tend to split them into two groups of main types of train games. And of course, we've mentioned multiple times already, but the 18xx games. These are epic, heavy, long games that use pretty much all of those mechanics we just went through. They incorporate to, to some amount, like definitely rope building is a big part of it and owning stocks is a huge part of it. The pickup and deliver, like I said, I think are in some of them, but it's not a standard for 18 sets. but I have seen them in other ones. Now, the, like I said, these are big. Um, these are extremely popular to a very small crowd, um, kind of like the war gamers who only play Starfleet Battles. Our, who only play advanced squad leader, right? This game has a huge learning curve. Um, I challenge almost anyone to try to learn them from the books from the first time. I've done it myself. To me, 18xs games are so involved that they're almost a, need a verbal tradition. You almost need an 18xx expert to teach you to play. Because one of the things none of the rule books tell you how to play is how to play well. well. And putting a new player against experienced 18xx players is just a disaster. Because of all this, because of the learning curve, because of the, the, the thickness of the rule books, the complexity of the rules, the number of moving parts, the number of things you have to watch at once, the fact they're extremely cutthroat, they are, they are not happy, friendly rail building games, uh, they are not actually all that popular. There is a crowd that loves them, but not a big crowd. And so those are the 18xx series of games. And I should point this out because I, you know what, it took a long time before anyone pointed it out to me. Uh, the reason it's 18xx is 99% of these games are set in the 1800s because that was the age of rail when they were trying to make the Trans America Railway and the Canadian Railway. All, and... all based off of 1829, I believe, was the original. So it was either 1829 or 1830. 1830 is the most well known, but I think there might have been one before it. But like most of these games are like you'll find 18 various numbers, but then you'll find other ones like 18 Chesapeake, which is set in a certain time. And there's 18 AZ, which I think takes a small section of Arizona. There are hundreds of these. For how small a market it is, there are a surprisingly large number of 18xx games. Now, the next big type of train game is the crayon rails. This is the predecessor to modern train games. And to be honest, the predecessor to almost every modern route building game. 
These did it first. Um, Empire Builder is the most well-known, most famous, possibly the first one. I'll admit I didn't deep dive what was the first Crayon Rail game. But these are the stuff that, that my parents and my grandparents played. Like the, You're going back 60s and 70s train games here. And these are all about route building. You have a map of whatever area with a bunch of dots on it, and you literally use a crayon to draw your routes between the dots. Um, most of these don't have any goods to pick up. There's no stocks, though they do tend to feature a detailed economy of some type, like how many roads you can build or your bonus you get for making connections, how much it spends to go through difficult terrain or over a mountain and stuff like that. Uh, interestingly, uh, Empire Builder is the first, and I'll be, I, I thought so. It's actually 1980. I, I, I could have sworn I read something about them in the 70s. So, well, BGG's list of crayon games, let me say, let me, okay. let me point it. BGG's list of crayon games shows Empire Builder as the first at 1980. Uh, interesting, but I don't I know. I could have sworn it was 70s, or maybe it's based on something. Fair enough. All the, right. The newest one being Martian Rails in 2009. Wow, that's that's actually newer than I thought. <laughs> I've got a copy of Empire Builder. It's back there. I swear it was older than that. Like I remember it well in nineteen eighty, I was only five years old. But I remember my dad playing it with with friends for years. So right. fair enough. Well, that is the crayon rails games. Yes. So those are the two big categories. Like in general, when we say train games, those are the two big ones. Now, most other train games fall somewhere on the scale of crayon to eighteen XX. And to be honest, beyond that. So, like, think of visible light and how you got ultra ultraviolet and you got infrared. It's kind of like that. There's, there's crayon rails and 18XX, but technically you can kind of go past both of those. Now, Ticket to Ride is basically a simplified crayon rail, right? The, the, you're, not, you're, you're not using crayons. You're using little plastic trains, but it's basically a crayon rail game. Whereas Age of Steam and Steam and Railways of the World is kind of, it has the rope building of crayon rails but then it adds in auctions and pick up and deliver mechanics so it's actually closer on the 18xx scale of train games now there's even the deck building game trains which you want to divert from an 18xx game you can't get much further away but you know what it's even got a lot of crayon rail elements because this is a deck building game that has a board and some of your cards let you put cubes out onto hexes and those cubes represent routes that you're building and they give you end game scoring so yeah, it's not what you'd initially think of when you think of an 18xx, but it is definitely a game themed about train that has crayon rail elements of connecting routes. And that's, I, I think, where, where we're starting to actually hone in on something here. I actually think our proper definition of chain games may lie with any game derived from old crayon rail games, whether that's the 1980s Empire Builder or future ones. And this is where the argument that the train gamers like to use that Power Grid is a train game actually makes sense. Where normally I would argue this to my dying days, but Power Grid was based on Empire Builder. And the original prototype versions of Power Grid before they got out to market actually had the players using crayons to draw your connected power plants on the map. And it didn't matter if you had a map, it just mattered if you had the grid, the line, which was, actually makes the game name make a little more sense than the modern one because all you were worried about was the power, the power grid itself and not actually building individual factories. And to be honest, like it's almost the way most modern role-playing games are in some way inspired by and based on Dungeons & Dragons. And the same reason a lot of people call every role-playing game out there, to some people's chagrin, Dungeons & Dragons. But then the definition of a role-playing game shouldn't be any game based on Dungeons & Dragons. Yes. Uh, and similarly, while maybe any game derived from Crayon Rail game is a train game, mm -hmm. there are definitely a number of train-themed games out there that have nothing to do with that original sure. system. And what about games derived from the original concept that have gone in different ways? Mm -hmm. If you take Empire Builder and reskin it into a game about airplanes, is it a train game? To most train gamers, it is. That, that's the power grid argument, right? Like you, you are changing it, but you are still building routes or you are still owning stocks. And like, Looking even at that, so so let's say let's say I did want to go with crayon, crayon rails. Well, where's Russian railroads filling? I talked about that one earlier. There, there's no crayon. There's no rope building. You're still building tracks. You're still improving engines. You're actually going to cities. You're you're not delivering goods, but as you move through cities, you get to upgrade them. Those are all huge aspects of 18xx games. 
but Russian Railroads has nothing in similar to a crayon rail game to me at all. Or Yardmaster, which is a a a uh, drafting game where you're building your cargo train and selecting which cargo goes in. Or if you really want to stretch it, is Train of Thought, which is a word game with a train theme where you have little dry erase choo choos where you're writing in the smoke. It's a party game. How does that fit? Or another one, I threw this one behind me because I'm like, it's got trains in it. Colt Express. It's a programmed movement train heist game that has a 3D train in it. Is that a train game? Or Rail Pass. It's it's a lightning quick game that plays in under 10 minutes. How do I compare a 10-minute game to a 10-hour 18xx game? Uh, and I even saw when we were discussing this uh, a week or so ago, uh, Mexican train game, the Domino's yeah. game was listed as a train game. And that's, I mean... Yeah, me, you're you're out uh, there. Yeah, I mean, that's really stretching it, but I've seen it defined as a train game. I will say, actually, Mexican train does have one element that's similar to the 18X games where you don't necessarily own a road. You have to play a domino and you can add to other roads. Well, sorry, you do. You own your train, but if you can't match your own, you have to build someone else's road. So that's yep. an element of, of those road building games that actually might fit in there. Now, I'm sure there's some gamers out there probably screaming at us right now, or if they even listen to our show anymore, are screaming, those aren't train games. But I got to say, why not? Right? Like I said, Russian Railroads, I'm building track, I'm upgrading engines, I'm founding towns, I'm improving them. It, it's all stuff in an 18X. Yardmaster, I'm building rail cars of different goods and values, and I'm going to get points on the load I can deliver at the end. No, I don't necessarily deliver, but it's got that theme of delivery. Rail Pass, I am, it's a pickup and deliver game. And I almost want to say it's the most pure pickup and deliver game because you literally physically load a train, pick it up, and deliver it to another player, possibly even going through a train tunnel on the way to the other player. Like you do that, you pick it up and actually deliver the train. And I've even heard a number of people, a surprising number of people, claim that Ticket to Ride isn't a trade game. I want to point this one out in particular because Ticket to Ride is actually about investing in different train companies through drafting cards of different colors and building routes to connect cities on the map to complete contracts. If instead of plastic trains, you had to use crayons to draw the routes and the blue train cards were represented by B&O stock certificates and the red train cards were represented by CH&O stock certificates, would those train gamers consider it a train game then? Because that's all it is, is a simplified theme. And I'm certain they would, but again, it's not framed that way to them. So yes, it misses the Wait, point. Which maybe that's a mark. Maybe, maybe Days of Wonder, if you're listening, put out a, a statement about it. Like, honestly, put an, like, an 18xx themed version of Ticket to Ride. I like, I think they've done it because 18 or sorry, Ticket to Ride Pennsylvania added the stocks in. And Pennsylvania is one of the most well known railroads and one of the most popular 18x. I think that was their attempt to reach out to that market. Honestly, after all this, like looking at all this, yeah, there's some argument for the crayon rail thing. Like I can, I can at least see that. I can see a, a, a train of thought as we were going along with earlier that makes that kind of make sense to me. But to honestly, for it to be a train game, it has to have trains. It has to be prominent. Like if there's trains, planes, and automobiles in the game, then it's transport game. It just has to have trains. And I, I, how you use the trains doesn't matter as long as there's trains. Now, having train theme mechanics like the ones we mentioned earlier is going to give a train game more of a train theme and a train feeling, and it's gonna gonna be more thematic. I don't think they're necessary. For me, for a game to be considered a train game, it needs trains in it. Well, similarly to the classic geek debates of who would win in a fight. The Hulk or Wolverine? I'm not sure there is a right answer here in regards to defining what a train game is. Different people seem to want and insist on the term train game meaning different things. And I think what we really need to ask is why. Now here's where I'm going to go a little deep here. I am sorry to say that I think a big part of this is just people's egos. People like to feel special. And there's a segment of gamers that feel that the games they play somehow set themselves apart and somehow above other people. They don't want the big, heavy, thinky games they played compared to some mass market game you can buy at Walmart that you can bring home and play with your kids and your grandma. 
They want to hold on to that feeling of being special and they're smart and they play hard, difficult games and they're part of uh, Puffing Billy or the, the secret club and only we really get what it means to play a real train game. And I've got to say, we're not usually explicit on this show, but that's total the games you choose to play do not make you any more of a gamer than anyone else. And no game you play makes you a better person than someone else. The same arguments are used by people trying to say one way of eating, drinking, or anything else people do is better than another. People want to be special, superior, and don't like to have their understandings or beliefs challenged. Now, people really feel the need to categorize things. And I know as humans, we do it. We want to put things into little buckets. If you need to do that with train games, why not use terms like it's like an 18xx game or it's 18xx light or it's really heavy or, you know, it's similar to Age of Steam or it uses a lot of Age of Steam mechanics or it's a family friendly trend game or this is a train game your kids would enjoy or it's a great gateway route building game or an excellent pick up and deliver game that's a next step from ticket to ride to me all of those are way more useful instead of arguing over what should or shouldn't be a train game yeah for us a train game is simply a game that features trains in it and we're fans of all kinds of different train games from the simple ticket to ride new york all mm -hmm. the way up to 1830 railways and robber barons and many games in between well, that's all for our discussion today on what we mean when we say train games. Sticking with the topic of train games, up next we've got a look at some 18 cash and 18 shares from Mercury Games. Before we take a look at these 18xx upgrades, we want to thank Mercury for sending us these prototypes to check out. All right, so what I've got here is a small sample set of 18 cash and 18 shared chips. These were designed by Mercury Games, actually the owner of the company, and were created as a deluxe component upgrade for fans of 18xx style train games. Now, what we have here are two different types of high quality ceramic grade chips meant to replace either the money or the stocks in your favorite 18xx game. Now, these are currently being funded on Kickstarter right now, are not expected to ever be available in retail. Though Mercury has noted that if these are successful, they may consider putting out more sets, featuring other companies and making them compatible for other 18xx games. Now, if you're seeing this live right now, you've got five <laughs> days left to jump on this. Sadly, the Kickstarter will be over by the time this podcast is released. Yeah, I didn't realize it was live now. I feel a little bad getting this out later than I expected. They were cool with it. They, they weren't expecting me to have it done before the Kickstarter, but I didn't realize it was live. So I do feel bad about that. Now, I will admit, disappointing to see today is I did hit over on the Kickstarter to look up some information, and they aren't actually all that close to funding. So I will admit there is a good chance they may relaunch once there's a bit more press out there, like, for example, this review. So I want to start off by talking about 18 cash. So first of all, the name, 18xx games tend to be 1830, 1840, 18 Chesapeake, right? So they're going along with that theme. So what they're calling these are 18 cash. Now, a full set of these is 400 chips, 39 millimeter uh, diameter, 3.5 gram weight, ceramic grade chips made specifically for 18x games, 18xx games, sorry, featuring iconic engine artwork. So I'm telling like like train engines. Now the count of these is 400 and what denominations they are is based on the most popular bank sizes in 18xx games. And one of the most common is you start the game with a $9,000 bank and the full set of coins is designed. So you just pull out certain denominations and you get that bank instantly. You got your 9,000. So quick to set up. Now, if you keep all the coins in, the total possible bank with one set of chips equals to $67,000. Now, they also offer an add-in for a special $67 chip, which if you're an 18xx fan, you're probably sitting there smiling and knowing exactly what we're talking about. I am not that big an 18xx fan, despite liking the series of games. I don't get the 67 chip myself, but I'm sure you fans do. Now, Mercury sent me one of these chips, and I got to say, this is nice. 
Uh, the weight's significant. Like the feeling in your hand is great. Uh, the texture of them, so they don't slide. It's not slippery. It's somewhat textured is nice. Um, the art, I really dig. I, I think that's a great look on the artwork, though I will admit I was a little disappointed the art doesn't line up on both sides. I don't know if that's because these are prototypes or not, if that's something they are going to change or if it just doesn't matter, which I admit, really, it doesn't, but just personally, I'm like, I wish they were the same on both sides. Um, this is printed right on the chip, so there's no chance of a sticker peeling or anything to pop out. And I, I got to say, this will fit great for, for any train game. Like, that look just looks like a train on it, and I really dig how well the number shows up. The rolling edge is rounded slightly and features the denomination on the side, as well as some color-coded bars to tell them apart, especially for anyone who's colorblind. That, and again, note this is a prototype, and what I have been told is they've upped the contrast on all of these compared to the copies I have, so to make everything pop a little bit more. So these are definitely pretty niche items for 18xx fans, real fans. The folks who are regulars at train game tournaments, uh, if you don't know why you'd want a $67 coin, you really probably aren't in the market for these. Yeah, very true. Now, one thing I can't help but do is to compare these with the Iron Clays from Roxley Games, uh, my set, which came from the Brass Kickstarter a couple of years ago. Now, taking a look at the $5 coin from my Iron Clays and comparing it to this $5 coin, the size and diameter thickness is identical so the exact same size now the 18 coin is just slightly heavier uh when i looked it up it's actually 0.5 grams heavier than the iron clay now the artwork on the 18 coin definitely sticks out and i really like how much easier it is to see the denomination in particular to see that five on my five chip right here and i do like the look of this for a train game but the Iron Clay, I appreciate that it's generic because I can throw that in a non-train game and it's going to be fine. Whereas if I throw the the 18 share or sorry 18 coins chip in a non-train game, it might be a little odd because you're using coins with trains on them to buy old power plants, for example. Wow. Now, where I actually really like on the 18 coin is the fact that the denomination is on the the edge of the coin. Now, to be fair, I think most people will get used to the color and know mm -hmm. that color X is value Y. But until you get there, or especially if you're playing with multiple different people all the time, those edges are a nice touch. Now, this comparison now leads me to price. Um, these monetary replacement coins are not cheap. Not cheap at all. And I'm talking both sets here. Now, for the 18 cash set, you are looking at $440 Canadian for a full set that's not cheap now here's where i need to point out that this is a luxury item you don't need this to play any of these games and not only that it's a luxury item for a niche of a niche segment of the board game community and that's a segment that is used to paying heirloom prices for small print run train games that are hard to get a hold of and are often ordered directly from the developers and the people who make them. So I honestly don't think this price is at all unreasonable, but that is a big chunk of change for a bunch of chips. I admit it makes me balk, but then I'm 100% not the market for this product. Yes. And I'm not going to, because we're looking at these coins and not these coins, I'm not going to tell you how much these cost, but I will say they are in the same range. Now, moving on to the 18 shares. Well, I think these coins are cool. Like, that's neat. The real highlight of this Kickstarter to me are the shares, the 18 shares. This is a totally new product, not a replacement for using poker chips during your game. This is something new for 18XX games. These chips are going to feature 40 of the most used companies from all 18XX games. Again, these are ceramic grade, but these are 47 millimeters wide, and the weight's up to 12.5 grams, significantly heavier than the other ones. They feature edge-to-edge -edge Victorian era graphics uh, that happen to come from a legendary poker chip designer, J5 Design. Now, these graphics, again, are printed right on the chips. They're not stickers. They're not inlays. Now, what these do is they replace the paper or cardboard shares in your 18x game completely. There are two types of chips for each company, which I actually don't have two of the same, but there are 10% shares 
and 20% president chips for each company. And the number of shares match the current amount of shares in standard 18XX games. So they do vary. It's not necessarily the same number of chips for every company. Now added to this, um, what I like about this is, is, is they make it easier for all players at the table to see the holdings of the other players. Because one of the things they've also done is besides having unique face artwork, the again, the running edge has a series of dots, one dot, if it's a 10% share, and it has the company name on the side. And what that means is you can easily look across the table to see the holdings of other players and how much stock is still in the market. And it eliminates ever having to go, hey, so how much stock do you have in Pennsylvania? Or getting up to look at everyone's stocks and trying to judge how thick a stack of cards are. Um, this is just a great improvement to a stack of cards on a table. Plus, don't they look cool? Like, isn't that way cooler than having a bunch of slips of paper everywhere? Yeah, yeah. these I get. Uh, despite the fact that, again, I'm not in the market for this, these make sense. And uh, as well as making sense ga from a gameplay standpoint and a speeding up the game standpoint, they're a beautiful addition to the game. Mm -hmm. So I think this is one thing where if you are into an 18xx game, it actually makes a lot of sense to buy in on the shares if you can afford it. <laughs> yes. So what Mercury Games did is sent me a small stack of these. So this is a mix of standard shares and president shares. And these are nice. Like, like you can, I'm showing them off here for anyone listening. I apologize. You just have to take my word for it. But these are really quality. These are nice. These are some of the nicest chips I have ever held in my hands. The weight increase over the 18 um, coins and the, the iron clays is significant. The, these are heavier and they just feel great in your hand. And they've got a really nice solid clack that's a little louder than your standard poker chip. Uh, the artwork is nice and striking and functional because it features the company logo in the middle surrounded by the company name on the outside, which is something I could always use help with because I always forget what PR and R actually stands for. Um, it does note if the, the share value, so you've got your 10% share or your presidential shares, which are 20%, is highlighted on, on there. And that's also denoted on the side. So you will see one dot on non-presidential shares and two dots on presidential shares. And they also did the um, name of the company, the short form for the company in reverse text on the president's shares as well. So this should be very easily able to see across the table, uh, especially if you know the system, the presidential chip will always be on the top. That's all, the president's always on top. So it's gonna be really easy to look over and see if someone has the, the highlighted or the double dots on the top of their stacks. Uh, additionally, the, the Kickstarter points out, and again, neither of us are really experts at 18xx games, but paying dividends becomes easier with this stacking system. Uh, and you can, if you've got both the coin, 18 coin and the 18 shares, you're, you can drop your coins out on your, on, on your 18 share, 18 coins mm -hmm. on top of your 18 shares real quick and easily to uh, calculate your payouts for yep. dividends. So now again, these are prototypes. And as I mentioned with the coins, the same thing, Mercury has made some contrast and readability improvements on these. Um, one of the big ones is to make the dots bigger and stand out more. So they'll be even easier to clear across. So what I'm gonna do, um, again, I apologize for anyone listening to this on the podcast, but I'm gonna go through the prototypes I got here and just show off each one so we can quickly see them. Now they are the same on both sides and I do have the same complaint as with the coins. So they don't um, line up on both sides. That's something personal pet peeve. Um, again, may have been one of the improvements. So I'm going to start off with the Pennsylvania Railroad Company, a nice green chip logo in the middle. This is a standard share, not a uh, presidential share. Then we have the Canadian Pacific Railway. Again, the colors here are also based on 18xx standards. We have the Canadian Government Railways, which has one of the most boring logos ever, but that's kind of what they did in the 1800s. Then we have the Missouri Pacific Railroad. This one's a little harder to see. This is where I think that increase in contrast will be really nice. We have the Texas Pacific Railway, which is the most gothic of the companies, as far as I can tell, <laughs> based on the colors again. Then I have the Wellington 
Gray and Bruce Railway, which is uh, one of the more famous ones. Oh, sorry, I'm I'm jumping ahead. Sorry, I have sorry the Baltimore and or or oh yeah. Baltimore and Ohio. Uh, this is one I instantly recognize from 18X. B&O is in all of them. Uh, I have heard many 18XX jokes about the B&O company, as well as making some derogatory comments about the cleanliness of gamers. Don't appreciate those. So this is the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Company. Then we have the Wellington Gray and Bruce. And then this one is a presidential coin. So this is actually a 20% share. You can see it says president at the top here. And again, it's got the, the two dots and the different edge here. And then I have two more presidentials. We have the Boston and Maine Railroad Company. And Norfolk and Western is the final chip I was sent to check out. So in a full set, you are looking at 40 different companies not just the small pile I have here and multiple shares for each company. Well, and it's actually interesting. Uh, they've, they've broken it out in a, in a very 18 XX manner uh, by, by looking at all the different 18 XX games and trying to save you the most money mm -hmm. so that if you want to buy four multiple games, you buy the 18 XX or 1830 set. Yep. And then you add on uh, different sets depending on which other games you play <laughs> or would like to play. So if you play 1867, you would buy the 1830 and the 1867 add-on uh, and have enough uh, enough of all the proper shares for your 1867, and mm -hmm. you would also have enough shares for a couple of other games because of the overlaps between the 18xx. Yep. They did a lot of research in mm -hmm. the design and coloring of these shares. I must say yes. that. Uh, if you do want the full 18 share set, it is 370 shares. Um, oh, the, oh, different shares. Yes. Yes. So, so your 1830 set. So the basic price for the 1830 set. So that's um, is 186 Canadian. That's for all the shares covering a large number of 18xx games including but mainly 1830 so the stuff for that um but if you want everything if you want to go all in if you want the chips to play their full range you're looking at 616 canadian but you're getting 40 different companies and as sean said 370 chips yeah. and again these are bigger heavier which is why the price point's a little higher you're getting less chips for more price and what i do want to point out is that kickstarter is great at explaining what you want Yes. If you have your favorite 18xx game, they, they are very clear both in text and with charts and a flow chart on making sure you're getting just what you need. Yeah. Now, again, that price point's not cheap, but I'm not going to get into all the luxury thing again. It's, I think it's not unreasonable for what it is. Yeah, and I, to me, the shares are the one I would expect 18xx fans to jump on first. Mm -hmm. They make so much sense for the game. Even as someone who doesn't play, I can see the value in this. Whereas there are certainly arguments to make uh, if you've got some, you know, price uh, scare, you know, fear of, of some of the prices, you can use poker chips for money. But yes. again, for these companies, there's really no better alternative I've seen than this. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there is an alternative. As far as I understand, these are a brand new product that's never been brought to market before. Like this isn't... Um, um, mercury's version of these right. these this is the first thing of its sort so i gotta say um i'm impressed like both like, like these are nice chips um i if you price high-end poker chips again the price point here is not crazy these are not plastic with a piece of metal put in the middle to make them heavy these are ceramic grade chips now i do dig the the cash and how it's themed i and i do like that it gives you like the proper bank for your standard 18xx games the real highlight i agree with sean here are the shares these 18 shares are fantastic not only are they beautiful tactile they feel great in my hands they actually take steps to improve gameplay and speed up games and speeding up an 18xx game is great because they are some of the longest board games out there on the market and i gotta say i love even like when we talk about box inserts what i like is anything that actually makes the game better not just makes me organize the game better this is something that actually improves gameplay as well as being a cool upgrade and looks awesome if you're an 18xx gamer check these chipsets out hopefully you can hit it in time 
if not beg mercury see if they'll do another kickstarter see if they'll they'll put them out to market uh they're really good people i've been in contact with them for the last couple of weeks um also checking out some other games of theirs uh get these out there these are fantastic all right, well, that's it for our look at the 18 coins and 18 shares chips for your 18XX games. Find more of our reviews at tabletopbellhop.com or right here on YouTube. Today, we're taking a look at A Little Wordy, the latest game from the Exploding Kittens, which is a diversion from what they usually offer. <laughs> Before we get started, I want to thank Exploding Kittens for sending us a copy of A Little Wordy to check out and play. I gotta say, that does sound a little weird. <laughs> now, A Little Wordy was designed by Matthew Inman, uh, who most of you probably know better as, as The Oatmeal. Uh, of course, he's also the artist on this game. Now, Matthew was also the designer of Exploding Kittens. You've got crabs, throw, throw, burrito, and a few other silly take that style party games, all of which were released under the Exploding Kittens publishing brand. I, this is why I was surprised to learn that this latest game from Matthew and Exploding Kittens isn't a party game at all, rather a two player, rather strategic word game. You can play with teams, but we'll discuss that aspect more later. Yeah, it's two-player only. Now, Little Wordy is going to start off in the U.S. as a Target exclusive, with a manufactured suggested retail price of only $15 U.S. Now, a single round of a Little Wordy can be as short as uh, five minutes, maybe even less, uh, with most games ending in under 15 minutes. This is not a long, involved one. But it is the kind of game where you're probably going to sit down and play a bunch of rounds in a row. Now, in a little wordy, players are going to receive a random mix of letters, which you're going to use to form a secret word. Then you're going to hand all your letters to your opponent. Players then use clue cards to try to guess the opponent's word. Now, each clue earns your opponent's points, and your goal is to have the most points when both of your words have been guessed. So, we... Uh, you, uh. For a look at what you get with this new word game, be sure to check out our A Little Wordy unboxing video on YouTube. Now, overall, I was pretty impressed by the component quality in A Little Wordy. I especially love the player screens and the clue cards are of excellent quality. Like you're looking at good playing cards, like that nice plasticky feel. The art on them, of course, is very cute and very typical of the oatmeal. And they feature some pretty clever puns for the names of the clues. Now, one issue I did have with the cards is how small the text is. There is no way you can read these from across the table. Now, I realize after only a handful of games, you're probably going to memorize what each card does. There aren't many of them. But for the first few games, we had found we had to keep picking up the clues and reading them and then putting them back on the table. Now, we aren't exactly eagle-eyed, though, so young players with the right lighting might be able to manage it. I, I don't know on this one. Like, like some of these cards have a lot of text on them, and that's looking like between 6 and 8-point font there. So I don't know. Like, there's no way I'm reading these unless they are sitting on the table right in front of me. So I admit it, my eyes are a little bad, but there's a lot of text. This is not a quick, easy-to-read clue. Now, my biggest complaint, which is probably not really a complaint, and I probably shouldn't be complaining about this at all because I'm spoiled. Uh, when I hear tile-based word game, I immediately think of games like Scrabble and Upwards and Bananagrams. And all of these games feature tiles, but they're not cardboard. They're either plastic or wood or Bakelite. And when I saw the cardboard chits and a little wordy, and if you watch the unboxing video, you can see this, I got to admit, I was both surprised and disappointed. Now, I did take a good look at the cardboard used for these because I was a little worried about them wearing out, and I don't think you have to worry about this. I don't know how to describe it, but, like, the cardboard's very condensed. It's very well-pressed. Like, they actually have rounded corners. They were pushed down so hard. That said, you may want to consider using something like coin capsules uh, to protect the tiles or varnishing them to protect them if you do expect to play this game a lot. Finally, I have to thank Exploding Kittens for a nice, big, fold-out rule book that uses nice, big, like, 14-point font. 
they could have easily just put out a little small booklet using a tiny font and two columns and shoved that into the tiny box. It probably would have fit better, but I definitely appreciate this pamphlet style rule book they went with. Yeah. So how do you play this new word game from the oatmeal? All right. To start a game of a little wordy, you're going to take a player screen and dry erase marker. You're then going to draw tiles from the bags. You're going to get seven consonants and four vowels. These are placed behind your screen so your opponent can't see what you're doing. You're then going to draw eight of the clue cards and place them face up between the players. Now, four of these come from what's called the vanilla deck and four come from what's called the spicy deck. No, spicy deck doesn't indicate not safe for work, but rather more complicated cards that sometimes require or a, a bit of give and take between the players. So it's good to know because honestly, I would expect something else from this company yes. in something called a spicy deck. Yes, which is why I felt the need to specifically point that out. Next, you're going to take your letters. You've seen what clues are up. You're going to rearrange them, and you're going to spell a non-proper noun word game. So it can't be a proper noun. So no names and titles and countries and stuff like that. Now, this word can be anywhere from 1 to 11 letters long. Yes, you can make a one-letter word in a little wordy. Now, once you have your word, you're going to write it down on your screen, and then you kind of fold the top half and kind of tuck it under. It's really neat looking, actually, the way it works. Well designed. And it leaves you a workplace worksheet area for trying to guess clues later. So there, you get it's, it's a really done, well done player board. So you're going to do that, and you're going to wait and see until both players are ready. And once you've done that, you're then going to swap your letter tiles. So the, you're going to mix them up, and the ones you just did, you just used to make your words you give to your opponent. The, words, the letters they just used, they give to you. Now, starting with a randomly determined start player, you now try to guess each other's word using the letters in front of you and the clue cards in play. Now, each turn, a player either chooses one of the clue cards to use or tries to guess the opponent's word. Now, each clue card has a value on it. This is the number of berries you have to give to your opponent if you use that clue. And these clues vary greatly. So just to give you an example, uh, this is a small portion of them. So looking at a couple of the vanilla clues, we have the Dynowlsaur, which the clue ability is first letter. Your opponent tells you the first letter of their secret word. Now that's really powerful. So it gives your opponent four berries. Now Mana Tweet gives you relative word length. You build a valid word from the tiles you have, your opponent then tells you whether their word is longer, shorter, or the same length as this. Now, that doesn't give you a lot of information, although at same length, it might. So that one's only worth one berry. Now, for one in the middle is the Bowen Sparrow. The ability is Letter Strike. Choose a letter from the tiles in front of you. Your opponent tells you if it's in their secret word or not. Can be really powerful, but not huge. So that one's worth two berries. The puns are, of course, much better uh arguably only a value with the oatmeal art alongside sorry audio only folks so those were vanilla clues here's a couple spicy just to get across uh we have the two communist whose ability is let's share choose a letter that's in both sets of tiles you and your opponent tell each other how many times that letter appears in each of your secret words so there's that give and take this can't be used if your opponent's already collectively guessed your secret word now, this is, doesn't give you a lot of information necessarily, so it's only worth one berry. Now, YOLO DODO, which is the rhyme time ability, your opponent says a valid word that rhymes with their secret word. If no rhyming word exists, they have to make one up. And this one, you're going to get the end of the word pretty much guaranteed with. So this one is the strongest clue card in the game and is worth five berries. Definitely not adult, though I suppose you could lean that way <laughs> if you wanted to make your rhymes up there. Now, the, the berries, do you start off with berries or are you paying out of a common pool? So you, what it is, is you don't want your opponent to get berries. So there's a pool of berries and every time you use a clue, you give some of those to your opponent. Okay, so it's a common, it's a common pool it, It's of like, yeah, there's a pool of berries. There's a bunch of berry counters and then you throw them, whatever. I throw them in a wooden bowl in the middle of the table. And then every time you use a clue, you're giving berries to your opponent. Right. So instead of using a clue card, you can always try to guess your opponent's word. If you're right and you currently have more berries than your opponent, you win because there's no way for them to catch up. You already have more. Now, if you have less berries than your opponent, your opponent's going to keep going and keep using clues and keep guessing and will continue to earn berries. 
at, at any or you will continue to earn berries. If at any point you end up with more berries than them, they w- you win because they can't possibly catch up because you're no longer giving them berries. Now, if they do manage to guess your word while well, they still have more berries than you, then they win. Now, with guessing clues, um, it's almost worth doing because at this point, your opponent just gets two berries if you're wrong. So due to this, or sorry, even if you're right, either way, they get two berries. No, it's an incorrect guess. Sorry, an incorrect guess at this point, your opponent gets two berries. And honestly, it can be more cost effective to just guess a couple words in a row if you've narrowed things down to like one or two or a small handful of words instead of having to go with the random clue cards you might be better off trying to guess the word directly it's only a two berry penalty and that's it that's all there is to a little wordy so simple enough i can see how the clues make word choice so much more important now Mm -hmm. to be clear uh do you pick the word before the clues are on the table or are the clues already on the table they are already on the table actually technically i said you grab your tiles first technically you put the cards out and then you draw your tiles, but both happen before you're making words. So you can you can deliberately choose your yes. word to avoid the clues. Oh, trust possible. me, I, I made this mistake because I didn't look at the clues and we swapped them out in our second game. So I still hadn't seen them all. And I decided to be smart and chose a one word clue thinking I'm going to win. Well, the new card that went up was your opponent tells you exactly how long their word is. <laughs> and well, then there's only two guesses in the English language for one letter words. Right. And one of those wasn't even in the tiles. So <laughs> I, I, that was the game that lasted less than five minutes. Right. So yes, that is an important strategy tip for those of you trying a little wordy. Look at the clues before you pick your word, especially ones that say, if there's two of something, make sure you don't use a word with two of something and so on. Well, and, and also, I mean, even just the rhyming one, right? If you can, mm-hmm. you know, pick if, words if you that can... rhyme with multiple things. He's absolutely don't pick orange. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, that one got used on me. The word I picked was Zenith. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, does anything rise with Zenith? Well, they do. I believe the clue is you can just make up something, right? As long as yeah, but then you're like, wait, wait, Penis? <laughs> like, well, you're going to guess every letter but the first one, right? Plinith? Does Plinith rhyme with Zenith? And is it Zenith or Zenith? Anyway. <laughs> Enough about that. Uh, the rules are very clear. Uh, what I hadn't mentioned yet that is important is they have an online dictionary specifically for this game that has cute little uh, oatmeal graphics of happy cats or upset cats if, you, uh, if, you, if your word is valid or not. And one of the things I do love about this game is I beat Deanna once due to a spelling error on her part wow. using that app. So... <laughs> So backing it up a bit. So when I was first contacted by a PR company who was representing Exploding Kittens, and they were like, oh, we're about to release the 10th game from Exploding Kittens. I admit I I came really close to saying delete, uh, but I'm usually more professional of that. And I was really close to replying, no, thanks. This is not my style of game. And I don't think we'd be a good fit. Because at that point, I just assume anything from Exploding Kittens is going to be silly. Take that party game, potentially featuring not safe from work, artwork, and content. That's just not my jam. I am so glad I actually went on to read the full email and click the link to see the press release. Because I'm sure I am not the only one shocked to learn that the Oatmeal went and published a real strategy game. Indeed, I think that's likely a mistake. It's completely understandable. Though now we can see that they're extending their range Mm -hmm. into other avenues, which is a smart move for them to be certain. And something I appreciate seeing for the board game industry as a whole. Now, A Little Wordy is a brilliant, small footprint word game for two players. The rules are clear, concise, with no ambiguities. This is one of those games, too, where the rules are two pages. It's a, it was, it, it's a one fold-out sheet that's two-sided. Uh, this is one of those games where, like, if you have the two of you sit down, one of you crack open the rules and read them while the other player punches out the word tiles, and then just start playing. You'll be playing in minutes. Uh, just the entire system here is just clever. Uh, building words from the limited tiles, Uh, the fact you can do any length, and then swapping them with your opponent, and then using those tiles you got from them, along with the clues to guess the opponent's word, it's just very well done, and just, like, after the first play, it just feels intuitive, like, I made a word, here's what I used to make that word, all right, give me what you used to make your word, now what what can I, what words can I make with these clues that I think you would have guessed, like, really neat, and I really like the, the berry system, The scoring system is brilliant because using different valued clues to give your opponent tokens removes the need to keep track of score. You're not, you don't have to have a score sheet. Like so many of these word games, you're writing down your word score, having to do some math. There's no math. 
you just hand them the number that's at the top of the card. And I'm sorry, that's counting, not math at that point. You just hand them tokens. Plus, there's the added benefit of making it really obvious what position you're in. You can easily look over and count how many tokens your opponent has, which, again, if you're playing smart, is going to determine which clues you use because you don't want to give them that edge. Now, the other benefit of this, and Sean's already brought this up, is that it really rewards players for choosing clever words and not just for making the biggest word they can. Yeah, based on the on the clues I've heard so far, and again, I haven't played this personally, you really have to think about your clues, right? The, mm. the person who can spell anti-disestablishmentarianism is not necessarily going to win because the clues can pull out some of that tricky stuff pretty yeah. quickly. Uh, whereas, you know, that that quirky little word that that's just sort of obscure enough uh, and, and, and unusual... Mm -hmm. maybe the one or or perhaps it's that really common word that That's... happens to fit in you know again it all is, it's all going to depend on those clues that are out there at the time and the be and being able to be flexible enough in your mm -hmm. vocabulary to to jump between you know that common word that that could or oh look mm -hmm. we don't have any of these uh, clues this time this is where i can drop something that's you know yes. the same number of letters as as i usually use but is just a bizarre word mm-hmm and, and with that, like, there are clues specifically for the rare letters, the, the J, Qs, Zs, and X. If that clue's in play, you probably don't want to use those letters. Whereas if that clue's not in play, you might want to throw one of those big xylophone words down or something. So with starting a word with X, you're really limiting the amount of options people are going to guess on you. So that, again, another aspect. Because Xerox is a proper noun. Yes, it is. Now, there is one aspect of the game I, I think would have been better, honestly, left out of the box. Um, I don't like it when companies try to shoehorn in different player counts though i do appreciate if they were like i have a two-player game and here's the the multiplayer variant and it's a real variant that's not here they they have a section i'm playing this with teams that basically says work together to build your secret word and work together to guess but be careful what you say out loud like that's it like come on like it's a two-player game in this case like that's something you could do with every board game it's like saying monopoly can be played 10 players if two players team up and and make decisions together no no that doesn't count as having a higher player count yeah not not really much you could do without changing the game i think you need yeah. a, a real variant game in order to uh yeah like maybe you'd have to pull out three different bags or something like maybe they'll put out like a, a, a buy two copies and a way for them to work together or something but how this game is now two player only now i do have one actual complaint uh that i gotta say again it's me being selfish i wish it came with tiles uh instead of chits like i i realize i'm spoiled i get it but i can't help by not wanting tiles in my tile game not cardboard chits i i I get it. Like, it makes sense, right? To keep the price point at only $15 US, they probably couldn't make a game with plastic tiles and still make any money. And no matter what anyone says about the board game industry, the publishers are in it to make money. Now, what this does lead me to want is a deluxe edition. And I know they've done this for some of their other games. So maybe if this game does well enough, or as well as it deserves, honestly, that's something we may see in the future is a deluxe little wordy or an upgrade set with some nice Bakelite tiles. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting choice. But I was looking at the rest of their games, which do have, pla or some of their games, which do have plastic components, and they're mm -hmm. all priced at $30 MSRP. Right. Uh, this is actually the lowest priced non-expansion game in the entire Exploding Kittens catalog. Wow. So I guess they are trying to get in on that lower end of the market with it and leverage people up into their other games through that. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Uh, overall, I'm sure you can tell, uh, we've been talking pretty enthusiastically about this. I was impressed by a little wordy. Now, a big part of this is due to the fact, the, the, the pedigree, the fact it's deploying kittens. And all I got to admit, I wasn't expecting much, right? This is a company that makes kinds of games I don't usually want to play. Uh, but a little wordy is now an exception to that rule. I will now consider all future games by exploding kittens to say, hey, that might interest me. Now, another aspect, though, which isn't just the fact that, oh, it's playing put, put out a party game, but they put out a good one. Like, this is a really solid tile-based word game. It's not just a unique special flower in their, their, their catalog, but they made a good game. 
I have enjoyed every play of A Little Wordy, and I look forward to the coming months because where I think this one's going to shine for my personal taste is my wife and I like to go out to a brew pub or go to a coffee shop and play on the tables. And those these places are famous for having little tiny tables. Well, this is one of those games with a small footprint, and I think, I think it's going to be perfect for playing in those kind of venues. So again, the cardboard chits could get ruined if I spill my beer, whereas tiles won't. If you dig the oatmeal's work and don't mind games with a bit more meat on them than games about kittens exploding or take that style party games, I do welcome you to check out a little wordy. Like, make, take this as your next step. See if you enjoy something with a bit more meat on it. Now, if you're like me and don't usually enjoy those kinds of games, don't write off exploding kittens on a little wordy. This is a significant departure from their usual fare that I think is worth trying. Now, if you dig word games at all, just go grab this. It's 15 bucks. It's, it's a great price. Grab it when you can. There's a solid game here in a small box. It's very portable for a small price. Now, if you aren't usually a fan of word games, specifically it's dude always losing with players who have a bigger vocabulary or who are great at memorizing word lists or just are good at the math of the games, you may want to give this one a shot. Uh, to be honest, I like word building games, but I hate constantly losing to my wife in them. This is a game where we're both on the same level, and I greatly appreciate that. This is much more about being clever than building the biggest, most impressive word. Well, that's it for our look at A Little Wordy by Exploding Kittens. For a somewhat more detailed look at this word game, check out the written review at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. I am very pleased to say that we actually managed to have a family game day this past Saturday, and it was awesome. Uh, this, this is the most games we played since uh, Sean was down in Windsor, and we've tried to cram in as many games as we could. Uh, that and we actually also did some gaming with one of our awesome Patreon patrons. So I've actually got a lot to share this week. And because there's so much, I'm going to try to sit there and uh, say a little less than I usually do about each game to, tonight to try to keep things on track. And based on what I saw on Twitter, it looks like you actually got some physical games in as well. Indeed, I got a couple of games and started learning a new one to be or new to me one as well. Ah, very cool. So out first... Well, speaking of new to me games, I finally played Disney Villainous with the kids. Um, as we say many times on this show, we are all about the new hotness. No, we're not. Not at all. Uh, despite this game coming out in 2018 and there being a significant number of positive reviews and a lot of hype about this game, it's just one I never got to the table. Now, mainly that's because when it came out in 2018, I was still in that mindset that licensed games stink. <laughs> Plus, uh, I've never been a big Disney fan. I don't know. I'd take it or leave it. They're okay. I, I'm not a big Disney fan, and we're not even really a big Disney family. While the kids have seen most of the movies, to them, it's just the same as any other animation. It wasn't until a year later that the game came out that I started paying attention to it. And what did that was the name Prospero Hall showing up on a bunch of games I like, like Horrified and Minecraft Builders and Biomes and Jaws. And all of a sudden, I paid, started paying attention to that name. And this is what made me reconsider Villainous. Now, it still did take me a get, get bit to get to it. Um, so I did finally order a copy from Raisman Burger. Technically, this is my oldest daughter's game, not mine. And got her a copy for Christmas this year. And yes, I'm terrible. It's five months in the year and I'm finally playing the game with her. But I, I finally got her off Minecraft for enough time to play a board game. You know, I've really never heard anything negative about this game at all. Yeah. And all the talk and reviews and, and, and online buzz about it over the years and people mm -hmm. playing it at, at game events. I've you know, seen, it, seen it played out at, uh, at, the, at different events in Windsor and I've just never seen or heard a bad thing about it. No, and, and right with that, right? Like, this isn't a new game. There's tons of hype out there. And honestly, it should be no surprise to anyone that this is a solid and neat game. Um, this is one of the most asymmetric games I've ever played. It's up there. And everyone that listens to the show knows how much of a fan of asymmetry I am. So just seeing how they did it was so uh, eye-opening in a way. And the neat bit I totally wasn't expecting is the way you play cards from your opponent's decks on themselves. That way, every character in the game is completely self-contained. 
and you don't have to worry about the odd unexpected combo or rule combination or interactions that you usually get in these multiplayer card games. I'm looking at you, Magic and Ashes and any of these expandable, keep growing, keep giving you more cards. None of that matters. You could expand this game infinitely and it's never going to affect how the specific hook deck plays or how the Queen of Hearts plays because it's all self-contained. And I thought that was brilliant. I loved how the different characters felt. And I got to admit, I'm, I'm, so, I'm, I'm almost writing an email to Ravensburger right now going, hey, I will happily review all of your villainous expansions. Uh, if it weren't for the fact that the pile of obligation isn't empty, I'd, I'd be trying to talk to them right now. Like, like this, I, I want it all, and I still haven't even experienced everything in the base box, so it's a bad sign. Now, like for you, I honestly think if your kids do Disney at all, I know you mentioned a few Disney things, you might want to look into this one. Because I know you guys love uh, card games as it is. Now, this isn't a deck builder. It's a different type of card game. But I think your family would really dig this. Indeed. And I have already actually added this to the games of list, to play, list of games to play when I'm <laughs> there down. There you go. So. All right. Next up, uh, I played a bunch of games of A Little Wordy. Um, I had mentioned in the review earlier, I was shocked when this was announced. Pleasantly surprised when I read the rules and played. Uh, this just doesn't seem like an Exploding Kittens game. And that's awesome. I love it. Like what I really hope, because Exploding Kittens is big. Like you're talking video game level marketing instead of board game level marketing here. Uh, I hope this has as much market penetration as the rest of the Exploding Kittens games and gets even more people playing games like this, more involved strategic games. I think this could be a big win for the hobby gaming industry, for getting more eyes on games and pe making people realize that not all games are silly party games. Indeed, since they're clearly working on expanding their market, this could really hook both gamers to their games as well as oatmeal fans mm. into the world of hobby games. Now, up next, I have the biggest surprise of the week. Uh, actually, honestly, even bigger than Exploding Kittens making a non-party game. And that is the discovery of a real-time, on-a-timer, cooperative dexterity game that Deanna actually likes. I think she has now experienced the sushi effect, but in board game form. The game in this case was Rail Pass, and it includes pretty much all of the ingredients that Deanna hates in games and puts them together in some magic way that actually turned into something she enjoyed. Now, personally, I expected to like Rail Pass going in, but I was overly impressed. It was more than I expected. Uh, first, with the amount that comes in that box, the size of the box was bigger than I thought, the weight of the box, and the quality of the components is really up there. I was extremely impressed by that. And the where gameplay is just brilliant. It's just so neat. Um, this is, I, I mentioned this earlier when we were talking about train games, but this is a pick-up-and-deliver-themed train game where you're actually loading a train, picking it up, and passing it to your opponents, even sometimes through a tunnel or over a train bridge. You're, you're delivering the right color cubes to the right cities. It has all the stuff that's in a big, heavy train game, but you're playing in under 10 minutes. And it honestly wasn't as stressful as solving the puzzle. It was thinky. It was trying to optimize movements, and it wasn't about rushing. And I think that's where it won over Deanna. Now, I'm going to be doing up a full review of this one in the coming weeks, so I'm not going to say any more now, except for the fact that if I had to write that review tomorrow, it's going to be a very positive review. I have to say, this was shocking. Yeah. Jaws were dropping as things unfolded on Twitter, and this game that should have in all rights been utterly detested by yes. Dee was, in fact, shown to be enjoyed by her. Yeah, I'm actually really disappointed that, unfortunately, she couldn't make the live show tonight because I would love to see her talking in the chat room right now. But, unfortunately, she's she's under the weather tonight. So, yeah, I, I, I was shocked. I... I'm still kind of late. And she's like, well, I want to play that again. I really want to try that again. I'm like, so she's asking to play it again too. So now the final physical game to hit my table was great Western trail. And wow, were we impressed by the design and gameplay here. Now I had gotten to play half a game in the past at the local game store at one of the game nights. It was an event. I was stopping in for a little while and they convinced me to sit down, but I had to go when my phone rang kind of thing. And this is my first time playing fully through the game, and this was extremely enjoyable. Uh, this is one of those games. I, it's, a, it's a heavier Euro. There's a lot going on. 
where you can't stop thinking about it after you're done play and you're falling asleep thinking about, oh, I know what I would do next time or oh, I would make sure I built this building or I wonder if we had drawn this. Like of all the games mentioned tonight, this is actually the one I most want to return to and play again. It was solid. And if you look at the pedigree of this game, go on board game, you scroll down and look at the awards this has won. And I, they're deserved. Now, this one was a birthday gift. So I don't know if I'm going to end up doing a full review or not. It may or may not happen. But I do know I'm going to be back in this segment talking about Great Western Trail again, as I plan on playing it again soon. Well, now, last week there was a uh, PD day, uh, day off for my kids on Fridays, and I took the afternoon off to hang with the kids and play DC Deck Builder with my son. Nice. Uh, it had been a while, and I'd forgotten just how heavy <laughs> the box was with a nearly complete collection of the DC Deck Builder uh, cards in it. Uh, my son wanted a refresher because it has been a while since we played. So we played the base game on its own uh, first, and he e eked out a solid win, um, followed by a play of the Teen Titans expansion, which I think I've said in the past, again, is one of my mm -hmm. favorite sets. If you're going to buy one and you're not going to buy the basic DC set, buy the Teen Titans set. Uh, and yet again, he kicked Dad's butt. So, I, you know, he's definitely uh, got a handle <laughs> on deck builders. Yeah, you have definitely mentioned that the Teen Titans was the best of them so far. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, stay away from the Cartoon Network versions. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the whole, well, the whole cartoon. Yeah, that's. that's yeah, don't, 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 don't buy those ones. Unless unless you like those, you, you have to be silly at the table. You know, if, if you're drunk at university, it's probably okay. <laughs> but I'm a little past that now, so. We're getting back into exploding kittens here unintentionally, I think. <laughs> So what would you recommend of the two? Like if you were going to start fresh. I would say if, if you aren't looking at collecting everything anyway, like, you know, I, I liked, I wanted as much of it as I could. If you only wanted to buy one, I would say go with Teen Titans. Okay. Good to know. So the other game I played this week and actually all three members of the bellhop team, all of us sat down and played the crew on board game arena uh, with one of our awesome patrons, evil John. He is uh, backs us at the seat at the table level, which we've got more empty seats. If you're interested, um, we started off, we had played with John before. So we started off and we left off on mission 18. We had just beat mission 18, I think. And we yep. were trying mission 19 for the first time. And whew, did it give us a hard time? Now, I think some of it was we were just rusty and then we, we were getting into the groove. But I think we tried like six times, eight times. I don't even know. It's a lot. Yeah, it, was, uh, it was rough. <laughs> it was rough. Like, like it, it got to be bad enough. I was like, all right, if by the end of the night we beat this mission, I'm going to consider it a win and I'll go to bed happy. We better beat this stupid mission. Now, we did eventually beat it after uh, 45 minutes to an hour of play. <laughs> Uh, and then did go on to beat like five more missions on top of that. So I actually felt pretty good. Um, some we walked through first try, we got through a couple others took us a little bit more difficulty. And then there was learning. There was a learning curve for some of the new things you could do. Uh, one of the things we didn't know about the crew, and I guess this is a slight spoiler, uh, mute me for 10 seconds, is there are ones that let you swap around the chips, which is kind of cool. I didn't expect that. That was a neat to see. Overall, uh, the crew's great. Like that, that is a great game. Um, Board Game Arena's implementation is really good. Um, though we probably should play on mute, I guess. We were a little loose with the rules last time. And I think all four of us agreed that there really should be some better way to track what cards have been played. Like I get the card counting is a thing that you're supposed to be good at, but I also get that in the physical game, you discard your discards face up. So like you should be able to get that information normal yeah. play without without having to go through the list of every single action in order um, yeah and and there is just no cards played show it, 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 some some games it's more of an issue than others mm -hmm. um and again we're we're playing remotely which it's you know it's you're playing if you're playing remotely you need that little extra help because yeah you don't have the physical components there mm -hmm. um and it, it's an odd choice that they left that out i agree uh you know, I, lastly, I picked up some wrestling cards that I learned about because of a comic book I'm backing <laughs> on Kickstarter, uh, Super Show the Game. And uh, it's a fun little game that really tries to match the fast-paced, um, back-and-forth action of wrestling in a card game. It uses a neat little dice mechanic to keep things interesting that's very, that varies by, play, by uh, 
uh, not player, but by uh, person your character, character. you're playing. Uh, and you can even actually build your own wrestler by following some cool. simple deck construction rules uh, if you have more than one deck. Um, now, I picked up a couple of their box sets, which are either two uh, character or two tag team character set of character or complete decks uh, that come with their special dice. Uh, and I think this is going to be a really fun little light filler or it could even be something that you actually turn into a local tournament. Uh, uh, if you had a few people interested in it, they're reasonably priced. Uh, and uh, it's, it's Super Show the Game is the uh, the website. Uh, if you're interested in a light little filler for a professional wrestling game, you might need to add and start a new list games that Sean should bring down to Windsor. To it's play. already in my quiver. Oh, so, there you go. <laughs> Perfect. Yep. Yep. Thumbs up to Quiver. We haven't mentioned them in a long time. I love my Quiver. Yep. I was just looking at Adventuria, where we have the starter sets for, for the Quiver. So that is one of the things I did. I read a bunch of rule books this week. Um, the ones I haven't played yet is Adventuria. And I reread the rules for Guildmaster. But I don't think those are going to get played anytime soon. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So it's our anniversary this weekend. And on I, I still don't know if it's going to be Friday or Saturday. The actual anniversary is Saturday. Um, the problem is the next day is Mother's Day, so uh, we haven't decided exactly when we're going to do it, but uh, the part of that celebration will probably be some game playing and some crap beer drinking and probably some cheese and meat, um, though in this case it's probably going to be stuff we already know how to play. Uh, as we've mentioned before, Deanna is the one who is not all about the new hotness or trying new games, more about deep diving and learning a game. Um, so it might be a game of Great Western Trail, though our first game took four hours, so I don't know if we want to play anything that long. I really want to get Corinto to the table, um, since we do know how to play that one, and I really want to check that out. Uh, I recorded the unboxing video, and oh, is that ever a pretty game? Plus, I know it's really good. Plus, I just want to advocate for that game. I, I really want it to become the next Azul. It should happen. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. And then one of the things that may or may not happen is Deanna tried to convince me to record some unboxing videos before our anniversary. So that's a hint that there, there may be some games that I need to unbox that I didn't know about. We can't decide. I, we might just crack them open and play them. I don't know what they are. I have no idea. But unfortunately, Deanna's like, you know what? Back in the day, I could give you a game as a gift. And then we could open it up and be like, oh, look at this awesome game and play it. It's like, now that you unbox everything, it's like, I can't, I can't do the surprise thing. And I'm like, you know what? We have enough unboxing videos saved up. The fact they don't unbox a couple games, I like their obligation, right? Their gifts. So it may or may not happen. There, there is a, a small chance. Um, she's not feeling too good today. So I want to talk to her about it once she's feeling a little better. I'm hoping she's feeling better by the weekend. She was warned it could be two, three days. I'm hoping, like me, it was just one day. So yeah. we'll see. Well, I'd love to list off all the games I'm going to play, but based on the fact that it took me seven hours today to edit these mm. show notes, I'm not sure my current work status is going to allow much game playing. So I got to say, it's, it's in a way, it's nice to see you busy for a change because often <laughs> you're not. So yeah. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon pa patrons, we greatly appreciate their support. Uh, KTOR, we're at that point now. It, it's so close, right? All three of us have now had our first dose of Pfizer. Uh, we are all now part of House Pfizer. And I think I might hear something happening outside the gates of Gloomhaven. Uh, those might be opening sooner rather than later. Yeah, me, I'm all just House uh, AstraZeneca over here. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Timothy Smith, thanks, Timothy. Uh, William Fisher, thank you. Danielle Thomas, thank you. Sean P. Kelly of the Gaming and BS podcast, which you can also watch here on Twitch on Monday nights. And you can catch Sean working on his latest campaign, whatever that happens to be. I'll have to admit, I don't know what he's running right now. It was Star Wars for a while. Uh, doing some prep work on live stream Sunday mornings. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcaster of choice, and sign up for your newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you like the content we've been providing and would like to support our continued efforts and our efforts to improve the show, you can consider tipping the bellhops at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop.
Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. <laughs> for Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.